Okay, so where to begin? Um, variety is really a constellation of Betty's fascination with film noir in both literary and film terms, and particularly in terms of female sexual agency, combined with uh, a kind of collision of, of interest in the films of Jean-Luc Godard, particularly Abu de Souffle, um, the lens of Laura Mulvey's 1975 essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, and of course the star New York, 1980 to 83, being the time at which um, the film was prepared and eventually morphed from the short film um, uh, that it began as into um, variety. Betty, can you take us back to that moment and tell us in your own words about how variety came together for you? Um, well, moving to New York, um, you know, right around that time, it was... Um, I, I had lived in cities before, but I'd never lived in New York City. And at the time, um, I moved to a place called Tribeca that was pretty much an empty studio lot at night. Nobody lived there, but artists had lofts and um, kind of factories made shift into places to live. And um, the art scene, which we called downtown, was anything really below 14th Street um, and even lower than that. So um, in a sense, there was a lot of um, activity going on in this little part of town, which was Soho was a little bit more commercial, New York Soho. Uh, it had a couple of galleries. And then there was the Lower East Side and um, Alphabet City. So there were uh, neighborhoods, and I think what what really drove the filmmaking of the time were the neighborhoods and the housing market, believe it or not. And the housing market was very depressed. There were empty buildings everywhere. There were um, people squatting here and there, and each neighborhood was defined more or less by who lived in it um, and how. Uh, what the community was on the Lower East Side. Also, it was more Puerto Rican and Hispanic. And in, as I said, in Tribeca, it was sort of empty of people, and there was no place to eat. There was no place to shop. So it had a kind of almost a, a feel of a studio. But in each of these neighborhoods, people defined themselves by where they lived. And some of the uh, filmmakers were interested particularly in Super 8. So all of a sudden there was this flurry of, of movement and uh, different people exploring um, whatever topic was of interest and, and there was this no, no need for professionalism. There was a sense that anyone could do anything anyway. Um, the housing market, as I said, was depressed. And when I first got there, there was a group called Colab, a group of artists who sort of got together and decided that they wanted to call attention to the real estate market and to um, the fact that many, many buildings, and it's still true today in New York, are kept empty on purpose. People are desperate for a place to live. People you know, would pay anything you know, that's reasonable. Um, but these buildings were empty, and so they said, we're going to take over this building on Delancey Street on the Lower East Side. And they did, and they turned it into like a space for, um, I remember it was Kiki Smith and Tom Otterness and um, Jane Dixon, Charlie, um, just people who were just local artists. And they, they just moved into the space. They turned it into a, um, a photo studio, silk screening. They gave classes there and engaged the neighborhood. And of course, the city didn't like this because they were living there, squatting there. And eventually, they said, OK, OK, you guys made your point. Um, and they made an art show called The Real Estate Show, and people showed their art, and it was about the neighborhood, and people were coming and going. Eventually, they got, the city gave them a building, and um, it, they moved in, and it was an old building, and it, and it set, once upon a time, when you could see the letters, it said, um, abrogado con notorio, um, a lawyer with a notary. And the only letters that were left from those days were ABC No Rio, and it became a really important performance space, art space. Uh, I moved to New York around that time, and I was so fascinated by the, the energy of that, the idea that you just do it. You know, you just make what you make. Um, there was 
really uh, just that sense of energy, of physicality, of being in a space, being together, uh, and the theater community was was thriving in terms of the, um, you know, more non-traditional theater, downtown La Mama, the Wooster Group, which is a performing garage, um, Richard Richard Schechner, um, just a kind of spirit of, of um, non-institutional spaces. And there were a lot of cinemas that were tiny little cinemas. One that I worked in called the Collective for Living Cinema was just a big old loft building and the chairs came and we put the projector up. And of course there was Jonas Mikas who had Anthology Film Archive down there and the East Village had Millennium. And it was a kind of, just just put it together and people will come. And, and the same feeling was true with filmmaking as well. Uh, you didn't have to be a professional. You didn't have to have a degree. You didn't have to know anything. Musicians were performing and they made films and filmmakers became musicians without knowing how to play any instrument at all. James Chance and the Contortions, for example. Um, there were all kinds of bands overnight. And so music and art and really the art world was maybe the anchor for all of this, a kind of vibrant art world. And I think that as filmmakers, we were much closer to, to being in, in an art world environment than in a film environment that sort of we, we didn't speak to that. I mean, that was maybe in Los Angeles. And in New York, it had a, a, f a much freer feeling. But, but at the time for me, it really was centered really around the art world, the clubs at night, the music scene. And people would just come with their work. Sometimes somebody would make a film, they'd say, hey, I'm gonna be uh, tier three, um, I'm bringing my projector, everybody come. And posters were put up and you know, word of mouth for the most part. And um, the band would play and it, it could be a well-known band or just anybody from the neighborhood who put a band together. There'd be a break and somebody would come and show a Super 8 film or a 16 millimeter film uh, or Nan Golden would come with her slide projector and while she was taking pictures of everybody in the club, she would also then have those pictures so everybody wanted to see themselves. So it was a kind of, I, I, I think of it as a sort of conversation that existed between artists who really were making work for each other in a certain way. And there, at least in film, there was no marketplace. There was nobody telling you that you needed an agent or those words didn't exist for us. We didn't even think about that. We just thought, who can I get to be in my film? What people, you know, do I want to work with, and how to just keep going and keep making things that we could bring to a club, or somebody would invite somebody over to a loft and turn the loft into a space, uh, or make a cinema overnight, you know, get rent a space for cheap, and just invite everybody to come. Eric Mitchell did that with New Cinema. Um, there were, there was Club 57, so many little clubs that could be turned into a cinema at the drop of a pin, but nothing fancy, just whatever you could do um, on, on a dime, you know, and, and there was artist space, there was um, various galleries that also would host um, film events, so I think that the time was free, open, and not driven by a market. The market could care less about what we were doing, and that was good, because nobody was really jockeying for, oh, I want my film to show here or there. We weren't even thinking about anything. Festivals, yes, we, we liked the idea of festivals because we would meet other filmmakers if you were invited to Toronto or Montreal or, um, you know, you, you, you would meet people who were doing what you were doing and exchange phone numbers and go visit them, whether they were in Germany or Holland. And so there was just an exchange of, of films and ideas. Um, so that was a good atmosphere in which to work, but also a lot of things were going on in terms of um, my friends who were writers, so that not only were filmmakers m showing their films in, in between bands, and of course the music could be driven by the British um, Sex Pistols or The Clash, but also, as I said before, um, my friends had a band that now is still playing called the Bush Tetras, or there was a band called Y Pants, or, you know, overnight, you know, people were in bands. And a lot of people were uh, really interesting, and they were, uh, well, Kathy Acker was one of them, Gary Indiana, Lynn Tillman, people were writing and reading their work in 
different places, whether it was an art space, the kitchen was really an important space at the time, just inviting people to come and perform and do stuff. Um, so it was a very uh, engaging moment. Um, we were driven also by, I don't know, literature, postmodern theory even, um, uh, semiotext, um, screen, camera obscura. There were many ways in which conversations existed between artists, and it was a it was a very productive time. But again, it goes. I think it goes back to the fact that um, it was not. There was not a real market yet. I think everything changed when Sundance was discovered, and that was when was Sundance? Was that in the '90s? It wasn't the '80s, I don't think. Maybe the end of the '80s. Anyway, but but so for this period of time, it was very open, very conversational, and not not difficult. I mean, anybody who wanted to do anything could do it. I also found that there were many women. Um, within sort of the group of friends, and people would just pick up a camera, um, work on each other's films, and there was, I felt very empowered by, by living in New York at that time. It felt like nothing was impossible, and I really relish, you know, that, that moment. Uh, I, did, I, I, just, I just grabbed what I could and um, made what later became Variety. It started off as a, a Super 8 film, uh, that I made for a, a show called Emergency, which was addressing the fact that there was so little funding. We, we don't have much funding in terms of um, the arts in the U.S. Uh, when Reagan was elected, there was a little bit before that that was, you know, artists could apply for little bits of money and grants and things like that. But once, once Ronald Reagan came in, all that money went away, and nobody's really seen much of anything since then. So, um, you know, $75 in my pocket, a little camera that I had, and I just started to explore. Um, and I was new to New York, so I would often get lost somewhere. And that is, of course, how I discovered the Variety Cinema. I didn't know about it. Or the F Fulton Fish Market, which was an amazing find at 3 o'clock in the morning one night when I was coming home from, from some band or some club. I just ended up in this brightly lit area. I had no idea that things like that existed. So a lot of it was just being out and about, going places, doing things. And the energy of the street, the energy of people, um, the Mud Club was right around the corner. Uh, the same places always had events. So you knew that if you went out, even by yourself, you were just going to bump into people. And a conversation could happen. Um, somebody could say, hey, I'm shooting tomorrow, or I need help, or you know, do you want to um, go see this or that? So it was, it was probably like you know, just this sort of energy and freedom that comes from an economy that, you know, is struggling and ways of, I remember people running electrical lines from one building to another building and hooking up telephones and sort of avoiding the electric company, avoiding the telephone company, um, sort of almost a kind of anti-institutional um, feeling and, and it just inspired a lot of people to do things, to get out and be there. And that was the key, is, is phys the physical presence that you needed to have. Um, and from that energy, there was just a lot of work happening and, and, and just the joy of, of showing, showing the work to each other, not thinking about audience, not thinking about money. You know, there was none, so it was, it was freeing. And, and that was maybe why uh, there was a lot of interesting work happening at that time. <laughs> I think it's a really interesting description of how a community of people come together to make something that looks like you didn't have to ask anybody for permission in many yes. different ways. Um, the pornography that you see in the film is, is not uh, you know, shot for the film. It was you <laughs> shooting yeah. the porno movies on your little camera. Yeah. Um, the posters that you'd see, now you'd have an an entire art department reconstructing those posters, but they were the actual posters, including Laura, Laura's de yes, desire. Laura's desires yeah. that I took for Laura Mulvey, yes. Um, but also I think one thing I find fascinating is that it, maybe it took the intervention or the presence of 
ZDF in Germany and the new Channel 4 mm -hmm. in the UK as two TV stations, which also maybe didn't have so many rules at that time, mm -hmm. to come together to take your vision yes, and yeah. to make it something more, accept more, more available in terms of... And that's interesting that, that, of course, when I said that it was very difficult to find, I mean, there were no places you could apply, no, no state-sponsored anything in the United States that would help you as a young artist, as a young filmmaker at that time, and still not that much. Um, so it was very fortunate that those of us who made these films, and the film that I made before Variety was invited to the Berlin Film Festival, and for me, that was heaven. I mean, I just, and, and many of us just were able to see films and uh, meet people from other places, and and that moment um, of showing, it was called Empty Suitcases, the people from, the producers from German television, one of them came over to me just randomly and said that, that um, she liked the film a lot, and uh, they would like to produce my next film. It was like, uh, I mean, you you couldn't dream that. Like, I didn't, what? I didn't even have a new film. Like, what are you talking about? Um, I had no idea what I was going to do, but it was, it was, it was so interesting that that existed out there, not, as I said, not even in New York. So German television was pretty uh, important in, in um, Germany at the time. The new German cinema was very much a product of being funded by t German television, and particularly this branch, Das Kleines Fernspiel, was a part of, of the producing of some of the films, Stranger Than Paradise and um, Wild Style by Charlie Ahern and Variety were three, and there are more, and it was a, a, a gift, you know, in a way. And it wasn't very much money. I remember, um, you know, making my own films and, you know, for $5,000, there was a $75 one or $10,000. But um, Germany, ZDF was offering $40,000. I thought, wow, that is so much money. I can make a whole feature on that. And um, I couldn't, but, uh, but really all I needed was a little bit more, and that was Channel 4. Alan Fountain, um, I guess, was the originator of um, this particular um, wing of Channel 4. And so uh, because we had been working with um, ZDF going to Channel 4 in, in here, uh, I was able to put the budget together. Um, I, I worked with a woman named Renee Shafransky, who was also one of the programmers at the space I mentioned called the Collective for Living Cinema, which was a, a great little um, cinema that a bunch of students of Ken Jacobs from SUNY Binghamton created. And she programmed and, and made great shows. On the weekend, you could see anything from God Told Me To by Larry Cohen to a maybe to a Michael Snow film, or Jack Smith might come in and do a performance. But then we'd also show Singing in the Rain and um, other sort of classic Hollywood films. So there was this energy of bringing these, this work together. And then um, on any given weekend night, you could see these films. And so I worked with Renee, and then she became the producer of Variety. And together, we put this sort of small, small film together and um, for less than $100,000, which was amazing at the time. But that was doable then. Um, and it was uh, thanks to uh, money from, from television. And I wonder, there was never anything like that in the US. Maybe, maybe PBS, which was the public broadcasting station, but very conservative, more documentary focused. I mean, good work, but l less open to uh, oddball films like Stranger Than Paradise or, or Variety. So it was very nice to have the support from another country. and. Um, specifically um, UK and, and, um, and Germany. So uh, that was a wonderful time. And I don't think anything ever replaced that. Eventually, films like, that, like ours um, were no longer supported by the, those stations and, and other filmmakers were, which seemed right. So um, that also helped. Um, I'm trying to think of like sort of the other moments of what the 80s were like um, in New York as... 
I think what's interesting at the moment is a, pr a period of reflection where you can look at documentaries like Sarah Driver, who I know is a yes. uh, friend and associate of yours, her film Boom For Real mm. about the early years of Basquiat. And um, also obviously Nan Golden's um, uh, uh, film, um, oh, The Beauty and the Bloodshed. Laura Potras's yeah, film, yeah, Beauty yeah. and the Bloodshed, mm -hmm. where you can see um, documentary footage of her slideshows and many of the people. Right. Um, and you can see uh, a, a variety as well sampled within yes. that film as yes. well. Yeah. And uh, y you, you really find um, just a spirit of, I think, I think somebody asked Sarah uh, Driver at a Q and A, well, "Why didn't you? Why didn't we learn about Basquiat's family and where he came from?" And she said, "Because we didn't think we had families when we moved to New York. We became each other's family, and it was a kind of rejection of the world we grew up in in order to create a different kind of a world for ourselves that didn't have ties to family that that pushed back against." boundaries and institutions, and I mean, I, I use the word risk seriously in terms of, you know, just pushing away the, the traditional um, ways in which um, things had been produced or trying to find new ways of, of making things. But of course, I don't mean to say that I'm also, as you brought up in the beginning, Jane, that variety is very much, and I think it, it combines an interest in classical Hollywood cinema, certainly uh, genre, with a kind of um, avant-garde, independent um, sort of approach, which are, are all these things that lived inside of me that found their way in, consciously and unconsciously, into variety, so that it, it, it was different because it wasn't one thing or another. And I think maybe is that uh, within this sort of almost really classical framing, which is something that comes from a lot of my earlier work, my short films that I made, a focus really on the image itself, on the frame and what's in the frame, and this long sense of long takes of being able to sort of experience the, the image itself. And I still do believe in the strength of the image, and storytelling for me is uh, at least in cinema, visual, um, and something that we don't, I think, have enough of anymore in this day and age because somehow words have taken over and dialogue. And just to be able to appreciate what the image has to say uh, is, is a powerful force for me, and it was then, and it still is for me now. And so within that form um, of, of beautifully sort of silent moments that you get to watch, there's also this structure of a thriller. And so these two things are not really fighting against each other, but they're sort of reinventing themselves through the combination, I think, of, of um, sort of two different ways of thinking of storytelling. Um, I don't know. Um, no, not necessarily. And yes, maybe. Um, I would. I, as I mentioned before, Kathy Acker was, uh, 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 is, was um, uh, an incredibly vibrant writer. And I don't know if you know her work, but one of the the elements of her work was that she would read and perform the work, and it was a kind of um, highly sexual, very provocative. Um, um, storytelling, and often she would take um, works of men like Great Expectations and substitute a female character within that. And I was very drawn to the way in which she spoke her sexuality out loud. So while I was interested in visualizing that, um, language was also important, and the way that Kathy used language was uh, as almost a performance of it. And I was interested in fantasy, as I said, and I, um, and in in rethinking what female desire could be, um, given that I had found the cinema, that I started to think about pornography, um, in light of a lot of other things, and I, I thought. Kathy would be an interesting collaborator, mostly because of her m m her writing and the way in which she delivered. Um, 
those those works. And I also thought that it would that even amongst my closest friends, that rarely did uh, we speak much about our fantasies, you know, even to your closest friend. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to allow those things which are considered private or taboo to be spoken? Um, and so I wanted to use the opportunity to have Christine, the character, speak those stories that she's telling, um, whether they be from her imagination or what she really sees on the screen. So it was a way of of um, using language, uh, but instead of being spoken, she was speaking so that it was an active form. And in fact, over the course, and you see that over the course of the film, her language becomes more and more opulent and her boyfriend, Mark, becomes more and more silent. And it, again, I'm interested in, in subverting, in usurping. I think that the character usurps in a detective story. She usurps the role. She becomes the detective. He, Louis, in the film, only is the enigmatic figure. Um, and in that way, whatever I could play with or reverse, for example, the spaces, the baseball game, Wall Street, um, the fish market, male spaces, was a kind of usurping that to re-examine her position within that, to pierce, to go through, to walk into, to make it a problem. And so it doesn't really feel like poetry to me. It felt like um, uh, a, a kind of a, a quiet, subversive activity, speaking your fantasies out loud. I mean, does anybody here do that? Um, I, think, I think it was a really interesting notion. And at the same time, I didn't want to um, I wanted it to, to sort of have a very spoken feel rather than a, um, a provocative, uh, you know, s overly sexualized, a kind of uh, normative, just speak, you know, say, say, and of course they were written, so, uh, but, but it, was, it was a lot of fun to do that as well, is to take something taboo and um, in, even from the very opening, moment of the film, I thought a lot about what, it is, what does it mean to dive into the water and to sort of make the ripples, to, to take the surface of something and push it apart. And that dive at that moment is sort of her cinematic taboo of breaking the surface of the screen to see what would happen if she went into spaces that were traditionally male spaces like the porn stores. N and not that I didn't do that, I did myself often find myself in situations where I was surrounded, like that night that I found myself in the Fulton Fish Market, or the porn stores that I would go in and out of, or the clubs, or the peep show, that you know I just thought I had every right to be in a space that anybody, you know, even if they were all men, mm -hmm. and that, that was the journey of Christine as well in search of um, something more personal for her, and in a sense of reinventing her own, or reimagining re her sexual desire, and to see what would happen, you know, in terms of where she went, and what she did, and what she said. We didn't uh, really work too much um, Beforehand, I knew I knew Sandy. I had met her through Jonathan Demi, um, and I kind of fell in love with her immediately. Uh, one of the things I think those of you who know Alfred Hitchcock's films know Vertigo, and she was my Kim Novak. You know, she was the image of a Hitchcock character, and very influenced by Hitchcock as a director and storyteller uh, and, and the idea of obsession, I, I was more interested in that aspect of, of Sandy. And we, we did a lot of, uh, I mean, the scene in the limousine was completely improvised, although we worked it, we workshopped it. Um, but n nothing was character building so much as it was finding people who were already close enough to those characters, the girls and the 
in the bar in Tin Pan Alley were my friends. They were sincerely talking about who they were, what they've done. That was not made up. It was not. It was. It was uh, their stories uh, reworked into my script. Um, and with with Sandy, it was uh, just very natural that we worked together. Um, you know, a little bit beforehand, and as we we worked as we went. Uh, and I don't think I was really that interested in building her as a character as much as talking about this sort of activity of following a man and what it what that felt like and 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 that sense of curiosity we talked a lot about. So there were maybe more ideas than um, trying to kind of form uh, a notion of who is she, what does she want, what is she, you know, what, what are, what her, is her character need? I wasn't interested in that so much as just following this journey and really a, almost a question for myself to see where it would lead. Um, I love to watch. <laughs> the longer the take, you know, the the this just the seduction of the image itself, the time it takes, um, you know, the the uh, just the ability to uh, let let the moment play on the screen. I mean, obviously, Bazin, and you know, there's so much to say about the long take that I don't need to say. But uh, I didn't have a theory about it, necessarily. It, it was just the way I was seeing uh, the image. Uh, or and, and place was very important. I think that all of the films I've ever made somehow start from place. And as we talked about New York, and New York as being a character, the sort of neon-y part of New York, and the half-lit dark streets of New York. The, the, the noir feel um, really was just this um, characterization of New York. And, and the longer I looked, the more I wanted to look. So that, it, it, in a way, the movie is really about looking itself. As I said earlier, it's about the pleasure of, of the image itself. And this, for me, the seduction of cinema when you go into a dark room and the lights go out and you're both alone and together with other people and this unconscious takes over and in a way it was the, just the journey of that. Um, the other aspect of um, using a long take is that you, um, you ask the audience to think a bit more. Everything today is so quick and cut and changing and you know, when, when, you, when we slow things down, I think there are more questions, where is she going? You know, what, it, what you see in the frame all of a sudden becomes much richer, the mid-ground, the foreground, the background, and, and just the relationship of, of uh, the character to the environment itself. And for me, I guess, you know, if anything, it's also a, f a film about color. Um, and, and those colors become language for me, and they, they're very evocative of just her, um, you know, her spiritual journey, or that's actually not even right, um, her, uh, you know, her sexual journey in a way. So uh, again, it was, it was just felt right. And so often I think as a filmmaker, as an artist, as anybody, you know, you have a lot of ideas in the beginning and you think and you write things down and I storyboarded, if you look at my storyboards, which are on the one of the um, DVDs, it, I would say the images really match. It's amazing that, you know, I, I, I had a camera, a still camera, and I went around to all the places that I was gonna shoot with my still camera, and so I knew what, what the frame would be. And the ultimate frame for me is the booth of the Variety Cinema. It is the thing I fell in love with also when I found Variety, was a freestanding booth, maybe from watching movies on late night TV when I was growing up in black and white, but that cinema, the booth, yeah, that booth, it is a place that allowed me, it's frames within frames, windows, doorways, this reflective looking. And in the booth, she is both looking at those people who come to buy tickets, and we are looking at her, and they are looking at her. So it's exchange of looking and being looked at, which is the condition of cinema 
Uh, and, and so uh, going back to the long take, in a way, it is that reflective activity of looking, of looking itself. I think that's a perfect moment where we have to stop. <laughs> okay. um, we've run out of time. Good. Thank you, audience, for coming. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Bessie Gordon. Yes, thank you.